Linux OTC. Welcome to episode 28. I'm Bill. I'm Eric. And I'm Leo. And Bill, you got an announcement. You're announcing something right now because I saw something on the website that you didn't tell anybody about. Oh, you know what? I forgot already. <laughs> and and so so if I didn't know about it, then nobody else knew about so it. So I, I mainly did that because okay, I was, I was just on the website too. <laughs> for those that they're wondering, what the heck is, are we talking about? Uh, I've we've been doing the work of transitioning everything over from a uh, proprietary evil third party podcasting provider. How With tracking? How dare they offer a free tier that? we took advantage of and took care of all the easy stuff for us. Um, I got to be such an open source, uh, creative common zealot that I've moved everything on to, uh, I say everything. I've still got about 10 episodes that need to get uploaded to, uh, archive.org. And then that's where the shows are going to be coming from. I mean, it's not going to matter to any, any of you because the RSS feed has been redirected, um, meaning that nothing changes. Your podcast players will still download the show just like they always did. Nobody has to do a thing, and that's the beauty behind this. Um, but the thing about self-hosting a podcast, especially when you're dealing with Apple, uh, not especially, only because you have to deal with Apple. Oh, please. You have to get everything just perfect. Otherwise, it, it, the outcome is shit. And wait, wait, wait! I'm, I'm, I'm. Let me, let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. The, the group that started the whole thing dictated a few rules, and they've been the same for ever. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so, following those rules, is it's tyranny. just the, it's, it's tyranny. You can just throw anything <laughs> out there into the ether, and every other <laughs> platform out there doesn't give a shit they'll just download the show show you the artwork no matter what size it is um apple no it's got to be completely square it's got to be between 1400 and 3000 pixels think, dude no 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 because when i was when we were show running when i was show running mintcast man i i don't even think i was very consistent with the image that i used on a regular basis and and it was like sometimes it was the 500 by 500 and sometimes it was the massive one I don't think it cares as much as you think it cares. I think you ran into a lot of Apple podcast caching because they started that maybe a year or two ago or something. And like it didn't update immediately. So it seems as though the image, I originally I thought it had something to do with the, you know, the image in the ID3 tag. It seems as though the only one that matters is the RSS2 image, the, the one image that, uh, the one that you're telling the world is your logo. Yes, yeah, that one does. That, that one. one turns out it turns out it matters. So once you <laughs> once you get that one, the plugin that we're using it's called PowerPress. It's made by a company who is actually another evil third party proprietary. Yeah, exactly. Podcasting Bill, what are you provider. Doing? Uh, you're, you're getting you're getting us off one to put us on another. Well, and... we're we're just using their software. Is basically. there any soap in your box at all, or what? <laughs> But I mean, this is all. It, it was kind of fun. Well, it's fun once you get it, once you figure it out, and it starts working. But then I, think I the journey's fun though. I it like, is. I like yes. it when. Yes, I agree. I like it when me and you are kind of back and forthing in Discord, yep. and and we're both subtly trying to push the other one to do the thing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I could uh, make the background on the PNG white. Yep, you sure you can. Could. Go yes, for it. You <laughs> sure could. <laughs> Yeah. So, is this a completely one-sided uh, affair where you're basically just submitting something to Apple Podcasts, and if it doesn't show up in there the right way, then you have to change something? Or is there actually like a, a way to go in and look and see, like, why isn't this working properly? So you've got two ways of dealing with Apple. Um, if you're just wanting to deal with Apple and nobody else, um, or you're, you're using Apple as your primary provider meaning you're uploading to apple it's probably a little less friction involved because they're going to tell you when things aren't right or they're going to fix it for you or something but if 
you're creating uh, just a general RSS feed using a tool on your website like PowerPress. They do the best they can to make sure as you go through the steps, you know, there's some information on the screen and that, um, but there it's there's a lot of settings and then there's a lot of uh, separate settings just for the Apple stuff. Yeah. And uh, but once you've got everything set up right and you've got the RSS feed running and you've submitted that RSS feed to Apple and then you've told the PowerPress plugin that uh, this is my this is the Apple account or not really an account but the the page or the landing URL for the uh, for the show on Apple Podcasts then it just kind of works from there on out. Um, but it's just that initial getting everything set up because when you go through a provider like Red Circle or uh, even Blueberry or any of these, like, I don't know, Fireside, there's a bunch of them. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that is just kind of worked out for you. Yeah. You just upload the image and then they take care of if it needs any optimization whatsoever, they take care of that. And then. But it turns out when you roll your own, you really got to roll your own. You yeah. got to get it right. Yeah. And I, I used Fireside and they really did just, I mean, you just filled in the form. And it was like, yeah, okay, that just was all there was. <laughs> yep. And it yep, was the same much. with Red Circle. And, you know, I honestly, I don't have any complaints with Red Circle. And if I was a normal human being, it never would have changed and we'd still be using that. But uh, I am far from a normal human being. Uh, I'm way too much of a control freak. And I love data sovereignty and things like that and self-hosting and probably for, and yet, of course. Yet here, I'm going to make the argument that you are trusting archive.org with your data. So, yeah. And that's if, a fair If you're going to trust somebody with your, no, I don't think so. If you're going to trust somebody with your data, let it be archive.org, man. Yeah. These guys have proven over and over for years and years that these guys are going to be good stewards of your data. It's someone else's computers, someone else's yeah, systems, I mean, someone else is making the decisions. Software as a service, data as a service, whatever as a service is not inherently evil. It's the people behind them, the corporatization, the uh, the the extraction of every monetizable metric that makes that kind of thing bad. Does archive.org cost money? No. no if it did, would you pay for it? Yes. Really? I would. Uh, I mean, I pay Fireside right now. So if if you're telling me there's there's a group of people that would do that kind of thing for just for the same amount of money, but with better standards, yeah, sure, okay. And I mean, they're just they're huge in the whole Creative Commons space. You know, that's just that is the de facto file dump for all things Creative Commons and and you know publicly, uh, what's the word, public sector or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's not, see, it's not a company. It's not a company that needs to be profitable in order to exist. It's it's something more akin to uh, Wikipedia, I think. Where yes. does their money come from? Donations. Donations. They, they, they are a public library, essentially. Okay. I yeah. mean, the same as the library that you would go to, except they get sued more because they, <laughs> they try to act as a library and companies don't like that. Yeah, I actually they've thought tried I heard to, that they've last tried to year. pull a few fast ones. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, look, dude, that's fine. It's it's not like archive.org is out here losing these companies billions of dollars or something like that. These guys are still making cash hand over fist. They're still uh, looking at gains every single quarter. Oh no, our one point five percent. We could we could have one point five percent more if we just. Spend that exact amount of money suing archive.org. Like, really? Really? Yeah. And and I do give archive.org money at least once a year. I try to give them once every month when I'm thinking about it. I don't have anything automatic set up. But yeah, they, it's it's when when Jimmy Wales comes up on top of the website of Wikipedia, he's like, "Give me the money, please." I'm like, "All right, fine." You know, an archive does a little bit of that too. To be yeah, no, to they be do. honest, it That's... works on me because I'm a forgetful guy, and then I'll go to archive because I'm using the Wayback Machine, dude. I use the Wayback Machine so much oh, for gosh. the history episodes in Linux user space that I mean, if I hadn't been paying them, I would really need to start because we're talking. I mean. I've I've pulled hundreds of megabytes of data off of uh, you know websites that just don't exist anymore. So yeah. they they deserve they deserve a buck or two. Don't don't give it to us. Give it to them. Uh, okay, I mean, but also 
I don't I, know. How, actually, we do we even take money? I don't know. <laughs> no, not yet. But I, I've I've been okay. considering it. I just having a full time job just gets in the way of all the things I'd rather. All you got to do is is uh, download an Ubuntu Snap wallet <sighs> so that the hackers can take all your money. Okay. And <laughs> Why then on earth? Just... That's a. <laughs> you've got you've got the equivalent of enough money to retire in on you know in bitcoin and you're gonna you're gonna install some random shite from the snap store that probably doesn't even have any comments or stars on it yeah you know what i'm talking about where you look at a you look at an application i had a hard time believing that was a real story frankly it's a little bit far-fetched because it was stupid not at all I, I don't think so. But why, why Eric? Why do you think it's far-fetched? Because there was so little prompting. All it basically said was put in your ID and like you'd be dumb enough to just, like Bill said, you know, you're going to just randomly pick a snap. Like you're smart enough to install a snap package, but you're too dumb to know not to put your financial information into and like completely nondescript Have you, random piece of software. It, crypto is different, man. All you need is your private key. And that is essentially your digital wallet. Yeah, and no, you can I get take that, but it pretty much anywhere. I wouldn't think but, that like, I would think that would be like you know, crypto one oh one is like that key is so important you never just randomly, you know No. You you lost the technical people after about twenty twelve. Yeah. After twenty twelve you started to see this gold rush mentality of people just being like, Oh my god, those guys, you know, a hundred tupled their money let's go and then they just dove in and lost tons of it because they lost the flash drive you you heard the story about the guy that threw away the hard drive sure. in the Absolutely. whatever oh, yeah. right well, leo like, laporte still has what like a couple hundred thousand oh, yeah. dollars or whatever yeah yeah exactly so it it's not like anybody was pre- like had a phd in crypto crypto what is it crypto crypt- <laughs> cryptography what yeah whatever to understand how even to deal with any of that stuff. I mean, like... It just sounds a- so contrived that some rando, you know, on Snap of all things, which gets a lot of gruff, guff from the community, it's no, like someone the, made it up and peop- was like, so let's see if they buy this. Th- well, on, on, the, on the malicious guy side, I think that was the thought. It was just like, yeah. watch, no one's, no one's going to do this. Has anyone but actually verified this, honestly? <laughs> To be fair, no. I mean, you what can't. What do you mean? You can't verify the money that's lost. That's just oh. that's impossible. No, but, yeah, you can. Yes, well, you I mean, can. how? I mean, you can't. Everything is public. Nope. Don't buy into the hype that crypto's private or anything like that. Monero's the closest you're ever going to get to something like that. But how do you but narrow it down to one person though? That you this... can. You can if you know the wallet that it went to or the wallet that it came from. You can track it, and it's it's always going to be there. That's the whole point of that ledger thing. Yeah, I just I think nobody's done that. But, I don't know. If I, I mean, was reporting this story, I would I would absolutely need that kind of proof before I put out something like that because it just sounds like unless you're unless you're a crypto hater, in which case you you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna just look for the for the juicy uh, little details. How about I'm a crypto story. cynic? Maybe not a crypto hater, but a crypto cynic. Everybody should be a crypto cynic. Everybody should be. Yeah. I think even if you like crypto, you should look at it you know, sideways every single time anybody says anything about it. Because even if you truly believe that it's the future of money, there's so many grifters out oh, didn't there they just, that are uh, going to get you. Didn't they also just lower the amount you get, you earn for processing crypto or whatever? Yeah, but that's been happening forever. The the havenings, the great havenings. So does that happening. So does that just mean now we have to dump more energy into this than yes. we already do? Yeah. Awesome. Well, you get paid less for the energy you pump into it. So you're going to want to pump more into it. So you don't have to pump more into it. It's not inherent that you have to do that. But yeah, the yeah. And the difficulty goes up in solving those equations. So that means that you need more uh, ASICs, I guess, com- you know, specialized computers yeah, to, yeah. to do all of this stuff to even get so who's winning a fraction here? of the share. Who's winning? Hmm, is there a certain the same peop- GPU company? The, same that, people. Uh, the first, nope, nope. The first few people GPUs. that started it up, that's it. These aren't GPUs. The CPU companies are winning more than anybody else because uh, that's what Monero is, and that's what uh, all of these little um, crypto miners or whatever that end up in websites and snaps and everything else, they always mine Monero, and uh, that's always CPU bound. You 
people have tried putting it on GPUs, but Monero will basically set an update that makes it impossible for a GPU to be faster than a CPU. So it's a waste of energy to to do it. But if you have it and you're paying nothing for energy, then I mean, crank that bad boy up. <laughs> I'm honestly <laughs> some... not even sure I've even heard of Monero, but okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, I've it's, heard of it. It's the security and privacy crypto. Oh, okay. Untrackable, untraceable. Yeah, right. okay. But that's what they said about Bitcoin, so. Well, the the closest Some. I've gotten to it is just I've got a I've got a Coinbase account and it's only for me it's just been like Shun Shun Oh, really? I don't know, maybe. I was I was I, hoping Eric was going to jump in on that with me. I've just had it like as not like something to invest in, but more along the lines of a conduit uh, if, to get I, money. Yeah, I have tried. I needed. To. Listen, I've I've tried peer to peer lending. We've. I've, it's not that I'm against new forms of peer to peer lending. What even is that? Just regular lending with crypto. It's it's fractional lending. So you basically put in money and then you choose which types of loans that you want to give out, and then it's like micro loans. And, and so, what is the return on that? It's actually pretty decent. You have to write off a certain portion. It actually isn't even legal in Florida anymore, so I can't do it. <laughs> but uh, nice. for a while, yeah, it was basically like, you know, we put, I don't know, we put like $1,000 in just to play around with it. And yeah, you basically, um, the you choose the grade of loan based on the person's credit score. And then also you can go and, and choose the category of loan, like some people are doing home improvement or, you know, and then some people are like, I want to take a vacation. It's like, no, I'm not giving you money to take a vacation, <laughs> you know? Whoa. Huh? So, so <clears throat> it's, it's, but it's kind of an interesting concept of, you know, this peer to peer lending. And then, yeah, you have a, a, you know, a percentage on top of that, that you would earn as a commission, like basically 10%, 15, depending 20? on the risk. So it's commensurate with the risk, the lower the risk, the lower the return. So, so you are the credit card company. Yeah. And, but you're not just giving one person. The important part is you're spreading it around. So you have so So hundreds. only some people will default exactly. on this. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and what you hope for is that your your total returns versus the write-offs, you still get more returns than write-offs. And we did. We actually made pretty good money for a while. Interesting. Hmm. It's nothing I would be like, hey, I'm going to throw a million dollars at this because frankly, like- it was a lot of micromanaging. You had to go in and like look at it and do a lot of like active investing um, versus something that was more passive, like an index fund on the stock market or something. But um, but it was fun to play around with. Uh, I think we probably ended up making like a five fold return. We ended up making like wow. five grand off of a thousand. But it was overall well, okay, so, so it was also over so a period I'll... of many years. So it wasn't like it wasn't short term. It was probably I see. seven or eight years, something like that. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I usually just see it as uh, kind of what Bill was talking about, though. Was just uh, you know, people have crypto to spend, and they'll give you the crypto, and then you can turn it into dollars, and yeah. you know, that's that's an easy way to deal with it. And that's what Coinbase is really good at, kind of swip swapping that. Yeah, not for me. Not until I'm forced to do it. I'm happy with the trans. What is it? The I forget the what they the termination. Fiat. Fiat. Yeah, fiat. The Thank fiat. you. The fiat currency, currency system. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I I read something somewhere a couple years ago, and I haven't heard anything following up on it. Gold! That, uh, <laughs> well, the city of Miami was going to stop what was charging. The country? Uh, what was the country that translated? Uh, they switched to crypto. It was like, Ven not Venezuela, like uh, Honduras or someplace something. Someplace down or? there. Yeah. Um, and Sorry, finish your Miami gonna, story. I'm sorry. Well, they were they were going to do away with income taxes and all that, and it was all going to be <laughs> such a very gonna, Florida thing to do. Yeah, they were going to invest in the guy was it was fun listening to him because he had the Cuban accent and he's explaining how they're going to run their city on Bitcoin, and it was and it was kind of it was interesting to listen to, but it was convincing. For me, because I'm not really into it, but I mean, it sounded like, well, it sounded too good to be true, but, you know, on the other hand, I was kind of interested to see where it would go because, I mean, it, it meant nobody would have to pay income tax anymore. So, so the, your, your key <clears throat> that you have for a wallet, that's the only kind of authentication you need is just the key itself. You don't well, have to. You, you can, you can uh, password protect it, basically. You can encrypt the key. Yeah. But I mean, you know, that's that's everything else, right? I mean, right. 
that's a little deeper than I've ever gone into it. I mean, do you have do you have any control over like the algorithm that's used or that that's controlled the, by the crypto that you're dealing with? Okay, yeah. so you just you, do you generate the key or does that get generated for you? The the the, the key is basically just your wallet ID. Yeah. Okay, and then you can password protect that with any encryption that you want to. So there's multiple types of encryption that you're dealing with. So like the the hashing algorithm, I guess is. That's what the coin is based off of. Uh, if you're this proof of work style stuff, like Bitcoin is, uh, there's SHA five twelve, I think, um, and then your Litecoins and your Dogecoins and stuff are script, and then there's this big long laundry list of other stuff as well. But I can tell you exactly what turned me off <clears throat> to crypto and specifically what I just said. Well, besides all of that <laughs> nonsense, the, <laughs> <laughs> the the Brave browser. So whenever Brave came out and they were going to do their their payments, if you they could, weren't shady about it, it'd have been good. Well, so the problem was, I went through the process of setting it up as a creator just to see what it'd be like, and you had to create a wallet with a third party company. You had to it not was, at the beginning, not at the beginning. Okay, well then I must have gotten in after the fact, but yeah, by the time yeah, but, I got but to keep it, going because I don't I didn't like that either. Yeah, exactly, and it felt very like I had to send them my you know proof of identification. Uh, like all of this. Well, you were basically setting up a Coinbase account, essentially. Well, it was uphold. Yes, exactly. And mm -hmm. it was it was very uncomfortable the amount of information they wanted out of me, assuming yeah. I was ever going to get something in the first place. And again, yeah. with the amount of information we divulged to just random third party companies who who knows if they're taking precautions to protect your data, and you know, I just I'm very uncomfortable doing that. Not that I'm so like afraid of financial transactions and stuff like that. I just feel like under the purview of the banking system that you just have more protections and it just feels more legitimate. Whereas I'm sitting here going through a browser that I don't know really that I trust. And then I've got this, like, we're going to ship you off to a third party and you have to give them, you know, everything in the world about you. Uh, and I just, it was really uncomfortable. And I just said, no, this is stupid. I'm not doing this. It's not worth it. And if you, if this is what it means to get hooked into this, you know, financial means of, you know, of dealing with crypto. Like, I just don't want to do it. I'm not going yeah. to. So. What's funny about a lot of that is that uh, I think crypto lost the real thing, like uh, the whole reason it exists once the crypto exchanges became banks. And at that point, what's the difference other than the volatility of the crypto that you're dealing with? There, there's not much of a difference. You have to give them all your information. And that that's the whole entire process of Uphold and going through that with the Brave browser, which is they're just acting as the bank. So that's why you need to give them all that information. They're tied into the Fed, the U.S. Fed, and I'm sure they are in other countries as well. Um, so they're legitimate in that way. The Fed's tracking it all. and But that was the entire point of crypto was to not have that, to not have those types of barriers. And you still kind of don't. Uh, where you could send send money to somebody in some other country without having to do like some kind of exchange. But, you know, I mean, unless they're spending that money at a place that accepts that particular crypto, you're already having to exchange it anyway. So you're already playing the game. So yeah. I don't know. Uh, it's it's an interesting thing. But uh, all I have to say about it is if it's if it sounds like it's too good to be true, it must be BitConnect. So has there been any, seen that? has there been any more legitimate use for blockchain technology? Because that was, remember, that was like the hype, right? Blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. Everything's got to be blockchain. And all these companies well, are like, we're going to use blockchain. And just like- It's like but, AI right now. Exactly. Yeah. But has there yeah. actually been that you're aware of a legitimate, like, this is a great fit for what we're trying to do? If If you need a distributed ledger- as in a database, if you need a database that is distributed, that guarantees that the data in it is, has been verified by more than 50% of the other parties involved, man, you got it. That's it. That's that's an absolute win if that's what you need. Outside of that. I, I wonder if it's been a hard sell. Like, okay, so who would be the, who would be the, uh, who would benefit from this? And it would, you know, okay, so maybe financial institutions or somebody that needs to maintain medical records or something like that, you know, and these places, not knowing what any of this means, not knowing anything about cr cryptography, they see that, well, this thing works by, like, having all these computers 
on all the time, and every one of these computers has got a copy of every one of these contracts. Yeah. And I wonder if that would turn, like, serious people off from it, where they, they would feel as though they really don't have control over where that where that data is and who can see it. Well, no, no, no. Don't don't make your ledger public. That's that's the wrong play. If you've got secret information to hold, the only parties that you know have gone through multiple layers of security should e- ever even have seen the database in the first place. So, I just think it's easier for non technical people to grasp the idea that this the all of these files are sitting. Uh, in a directory, and it's inside that machine that's inside that vault. But you just don't describe it like a crypto thing. You don't describe it uh, as a blockchain. You just that's say, how crypto people are, though. You know, yeah, but when, crypto whenever people you... are into the money aspect of it, and they they just want to use a bunch of woo woo words to get you confused no, and be like, they... oh, that sounds like a great idea. No, if... the whole thing is, dude, just it's failover. That's all it is. It's a it's yeah, a distributed no. copy of the thing. And if you have, if I mean, let, just to take your medical records thing, let's just say for a minute that's what we're using to to back our stuff up. It's a fine idea. Don't use a like a proof of work type thing. Don't use a like you have to run a CPU all day to verify these transactions. There are other ways to do it that don't require a ton of electricity. And that's it. Just so now we have a copy of these medical records in multiple places. And if one of those places explodes, then we have all these other places that have copies that are not exploded and we can always go back to those right. to verify that you know this is your current medical record that's it so you you're you're doing you're running a business where your business model is setting all this up for people and you know you've got a great product right there and you send somebody out great to, to give talk too to too much credit but i get, well, I'll, well i'll play you know, uh, let's just assume that's true. And then somebody calls and says, okay, I want to set up one of these because I've, we've got a lot of data and I want to make sure that it's always safe, that it's always accessible. And you send a uh, you send a salesman out to these serious people and he shows up on a skateboard. You know, that's that's the kind we'll of thing that, that you, you, that's the kind of thing you expect <laughs> he from needs crypto to show up people. On a segue. And by the now, way, I hate that, that word crypto people. Yeah. Segway is the professional <laughs> mode of transportation. So if he shows up on a Segway, you don't even have to have a presentation. The CEO is like sold. And he might have a suit on, but he'll have flip flops. No, he, or he's like he's got the he's got the whole suit and everything, but the pants they're cut off. They're shorts. They are. So he's like, come on, yeah, yeah. He's edgy. He's cool, and that's right. That's why we hate him. <laughs> and he's and he's got a backwards baseball cap. That's it. Yeah, that too. All right. Yeah. Well, since I drug you back in time for the last tech fad, I uh, actually had a separate thought earlier. Um, since I was complaining about computers and being, you know, my pseudo Luddite self sometimes, when is the last time you have used some? We're longtime Linux users, and, and ha, when's the last time you had a serious like delight? Or just something that really was so amazing and mind blowing, or or even just so pleasant that you you just were like, wow, I I can't believe what an amazing you know piece of software this is, or what a great idea, or I don't know. If I I'm assume being you're vague. not talking about like the first time you like spend half a day trying to install Arch and then you reboot and you get a desktop. You're, if that's that was what, relief probably... more than it was euphoria. <laughs> I mean, you know? if that if that's what you <laughs> consider it... to be, you know. It was. I'd spent a real long time, but I remember when those were the kind of challenges that that you would have. But if you had or, anything lately, and, I mean, so that's the thing. Um, oh, Leo's well, gone. when I when I finally got the podcast to the artwork to actually show up on Apple. Yeah, just technical <laughs> successes are always good feeling. I think, but I, was... I, I think in the uh, in the ooh and ah sense, um, it's happened multiple multiple times over over my lifetime. Uh, one of them, I, I guess, uh, more recently, right? It's been the hard drive to SSD switch. Okay, like it's like, oh my god, how fast is this? It, it's you know, it's it's one of those things where you gotta like shake your other technical friends and be like, are you not on an SSD? Get on there now. Yeah. And oh yeah. Yep. Then, uh, then it was uh, going from sixty frames a second or sixty hertz to more than sixty hertz on a on a monitor. Like it's another one of those where it's like. Your eyeballs actually can see more, and you know you get you get to that point. And now 
I think it's um I, I'm I'm dealing with a lot of when I got uh, the framework laptop, when I got uh, a Mac, and when I have uh, 4K screens for myself. Um, it's another one of those. Okay, fonts don't have to look like crap. They actually don't. And when you cram four times the pixels on them, they look amazing. Like, have you not seen this? So that's that's my current one uh, because I'm I'm starting to to get a whole lot more of these higher density monitors and screens in front of me, and it's amazing. The quality that you can get out of this stuff, the stuff I'm looking at, you know, of course, it's got to be 4K stuff, right? Like, you know, if you're looking at a a 360p video and you full screen it on a 4K monitor, it's not going to look any better than on a 1080p or anything else screen. But other stuff like font rendering is the big one because it's huge because it it actually increases readability to things. It, It is... Uh, for me and my aging eyes, yeah, and they yep. were already bad to begin with, it is an accessibility win. So yeah. that that's my thing right now is I'm ooing and awing and uh, thumbsing up to accessibility, the idea of higher density, everything. More, more pixels. <laughs> Gimme. I think for me, it's just, it's almost a shock that, I don't know, in my younger days, I never really thought of myself as being an overly intelligent person um no more than anybody else you got street smarts bill you got i don't know about that even um but then i I set these servers up wicked Uh, it's amazing to me if i'm gonna if i'm gonna blow my own horn for a second i set these servers up and there's literally like half a dozen websites running a next cloud server You've got all the the little paper cut challenges that go along with using some of the beta level tools and things like that. But overall, the Jellyfin server running a, on a ZFS pool and then all these websites running in Docker containers and then those Docker containers connected to a reverse proxy manager and then all of that is working out all of the SSL and uh, everything has been humming. I'm not challenging anybody. Challenge it's, been humming al- <laughs> it's been humming along for a few years now, and I have never. Ooh, I better, I better watch what no, I say. No What's the IP address on here. that server, Bill? No um, superstition. I, I've never been owned. I've never been owned, and this stuff is all internet facing. Well, I say it's internet facing. The stuff that is made to be internet facing. The, the you know the HTTPS and then uh, WireGuard. Everything is sitting behind WireGuard, so I don't. Uh, I don't have to worry as much as somebody that might just have their SSH port 22 facing the internet. There are people that do that, you know. It's that's a crazy thing to do, but well, they this almost stuff's just been got humming hit by along. that XZ thing, right? Mm-hmm. I was going to bring that up, but uh. the XZ thing, people have been beating that to death. But honestly, I've been thinking a lot about that, and I wonder if it's a sign of things to come because that whole social engineering um, component behind all of it's that. It's the weakest link, always. It absolutely is. And there is no, there's no way to come at a problem like that from a technological standpoint. You know, it's... <laughs> I think you could probably make it a little more difficult. I think there are a lot of people who have way too much access to systems than they need. Um, you can... But that's difficult, right? To set up the granularity you really want to have for different positions, different people. I think there should be verification in a lot of cases, second party verification where you can't just hand keys to people. You have to have someone else look at that and say, wait a second. Like there are ways. But what, ha- what happens? So th- that is a very good point. But what happens when the entire development team is one guy? Oh, no. Hey, and that guy, that was that situation was probably worst case scenario, right? You have a low no, level. No, you, it's not. That's that's, the that's thing. Uh, there's a lot of that no, out no, no, there. I'm not though. saying a that lot it of doesn't that one. exist. I'm just saying that that's the worst case scenario where you have someone who's already having stress re- related, you know, issues, who's you know already sort of feeling overburdened and probably working a different job and has family concerns and all the rest of it, who has been maintaining something thanklessly for a very long time, and now has this because it really didn't change until this this you know, these people tried to infiltrate, there really weren't a lot of changes, you know? And then all of a sudden it's like, 
oh, well, you know, we need to publish these changes quickly or, you know, quicker, quicker, and all this pressure and all this pressure. I just think that situation, while it's not unique by any stretch of the imagination, it is the worst case where they're, you're right, it's one person who has all the keys who can be not even persuaded, you know, browbeat into basically, you know, giving in to someone else's, you know, insistence. Um, certainly you would. So much to the point where in the end he was glad perhaps to give up the control well, I to somebody else. I, I think it's unfair to blame someone like him or anyone who's doing a thankless job like that, maintaining a utility that is used by so many different people. And what's interesting in this case is it's not necessarily that XZ had access directly to SSH. It's because of system D and the way that those sort of controls work and the, and the interoperability. Now, are you going to give people fodder to, to beat down system no, D? No, it's not. D, you, using, <clears throat> using system D That's just already happened. happened to, all, uh, to, to be in the majority of the chains right. that existed with SSH. This had nothing to do. We could have done this with um, SysV in it. It could have been done any way, I'm, I'm not uh, saying any that. other I'm way. I'm just saying that it right. wasn't a, necessarily a direct. So that's why it didn't look like an attack vector necessarily. <laughs> but anyway, I, I don't... I, that's my point is that it's, I think that this was the worst case scenario to have someone being put under this pressure. And it was also a very long con. You know, this is the the typical. Two years. Yeah, exactly. This isn't the typical someone trying to brute force and being impatient. This was someone, or let's just say potentially a state actor or something like that, that was willing to put in the time and effort, uh, who probably did a lot of reconnaissance to figure like, Okay, you know, I don't think it's an accident that they picked this project and this person. They probably, you know, figured out like who were the, what, where are the what projects? I, yeah, kind of. I, I think um, th this isn't the only project. I, well, I so think Leo Resington made a really interesting point where he said, okay, we've talked about this project specifically and maybe what to do going forward. Has this happened previously? Has anyone ever thought, right. hey, maybe this isn't the first time? Yeah, I talked about that on Linux user space uh, the last episode that came out because it was it, it was glaringly obvious that that we were being forward looking, um, but we weren't looking back. But what I think is not only that is that you have this one group, whatever they are, um, attacking one project. I guarantee you, there's more happening right now, right now. Like we can't verify the physical identity of anybody, so we can't even know that the people that are contributing to a project are are you know, on the up and up. But that I think is uh, a super important point. Um, and on top of that, you're, you're saying worst case scenario is, you know, someone being social engineered into uh, introducing a backdoor into something like that. But we, we've had we've had this exact thing happen with no social engineering required. But it, the common denominator was the one guy maintaining the whole thing that the entire industry decided to build around. This is the XKCD comic over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And the what I'm talking about was OpenSSL. You guys remember that back right. in like 2010? Yep. Heartbleed. Yeah. yeah. When the entire internet depended on OpenSSL, this one package that the one guy maintained thanklessly, never got paid for it. Dude nope. was needing money. He actually needed money at the time. So ha could this have happened back then? Absolutely. Anybody with semi-deep pockets could have asked that guy to add in any patch that he wanted and said, you know, hey, uh, we'll take care of you for the rest of your life. All you got to do is add this one little something-something into it. Don't even worry about what it is. Just patch this in. And so we're we're seeing this happen over and over and over again, and we're not learning our lesson. And the, the takeaway is you have to support the people that you're going to be basing yourself. If your entire project is dependent on something, and in the case of XZ, it was um, it was hooking it into to SSH. And in the case of OpenSSL, it's the entire internet and credit card processing and everything else, every transaction that ever happened on the internet. Right? If you're basing your technology off of this, and you're making boatloads of money, and it's not just a pay them kind of situation, because but that is part of it. You have to support these people, like as in, don't just give them money, give them developers that they can delegate stuff to and they can take a vacation an entire year's vacation give them the support to be able to live life while you are using their technology to make billions of dollars a year 
And we do like, see that occasionally. We'll see, you know, developers, key developers on open source projects that are employed by major corporations. That's not unheard of, um, but it right. tends well, to if, be. What if you don't want to work? <clears throat> For Red Hat, what if you don't want to work for Microsoft? Oh. What if what if you're not a Leonard Pottering and to get scooped up by anybody that uses System well, D? So then, if you're giving them developers, then you're also expecting a certain amount of uh, access and control. So maybe money is the is the. I think there should probably be a choice, right? I mean, I think corporations who are using. I've always said this. I think corporations that make money, concretely make money off of open source software, there should be some clause where they give a small percentage, and we're talking like a trickle comparatively, right, to what to the earnings they make. If they're making hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, a quarter of a percent to them is nothing. But to that developer, that could be a, a real living wage. That could be a real ability for them to, you know, have a better life and not have to worry about, because honestly, I mean, you think about the argument for a minimum, what is it, the the living wage or what is the Universal income. Oh, uh, universal. Right. And the whole premise of yeah. that is that it just takes the pressure off of needing to know where next month's rent comes from, right? Yeah. If you've got those basic needs covered, then you're just going to function better as a human being. And so, you know, I think you probably could say, look, I need development resources. This is bigger than I, you know, no one's stepping up. So maybe that case, then yeah, a corporation. But I, it's almost like there should be some sort of a, advocacy group or some sort of middle layer there because developers are already busy they already have you're about to say the word union and everybody's gonna hit stop <laughs> no not necessarily i think an advocacy group is different than a union um because i'm not i've heard it i've heard it said that it's hard to pay these people sometimes because right. you have these people doing these projects and they're uh they're adamant about the things they're willing to accept and the things they're not willing to accept. And there's a heck of a lot yeah. more things that they're not willing to. So there's that. And then there's all the difficulties inherent to paying somebody who is overseas. Yeah. And I think, and I think it is absolutely a hundred percent incumbent on the group with money that's getting something for free to have to make the decision of, well, we can't support the person that's that's writing the software that we're basing everything that we do on, maybe we need a different project. It should Absolutely. be incumbent on the company yep. to be able to pull yep. out from using something if you can't support the person. Yeah. Because otherwise, this will happen. Especially it's going to happen. Especially for key infrastructure, right? If your systems rely on a certain you know, technology and this, and we're talking like the database, the, you know, the, the big pieces of the puzzle, obviously you need to be heavily invested in making sure that those continue to operate the way you need them to. So you have, because yeah, otherwise you get, you get a Redis and they yeah. do the whole entire, well, we're just going to change our license thing. Right. And then you get redict and 12 other different offshoots <laughs> and everybody's like, please pick me, pick me. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh God. Which, you know, is, isn't it, necessarily always the worst thing. There can be specialization. There can be niche markets that are covered by certain, you know, things like that. And forking is not a bad thing. But I no, do, I all. don't disagree that it takes away some of the impetus and some of the m momentum and mind share from larger projects whenever they splinter off like that. Yeah, but everybody always coalesces around one. I, I guarantee you there's Normally. there's going to be one that wins the battle and then the others will continue on yeah. doing their own thing. And that but yeah, that's that's a good thing, but I mean, there's a winner out of all of those situations. Yeah. Well, and I necessarily can't fault some like Red Redis and, you know, other projects for basically wanting to take a stand and say, "Look, you are standing on our backs." Uh, you know, asking mm -hmm. us to do things to benefit you um, very, very much financially. And there has got to be some reciprocity here. There just has to yeah. be. Yeah, absolutely. Otherwise you get vacuumed up into AWS and <laughs> you'll never, you'll never see a single cent from any of them unless somehow yeah. you force them. But, you know, and the, cloud, the unfortunate. I think, sorry, I think cloud is definitely one of the biggest offenders here out of Oh, all yeah. of this, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's one of the biggest cash cows. It's the entire reason Amazon is who they are. 
they make the vast majority of their money off of selling people software and services and AWS in general. And that's why Google and Microsoft are clamoring like Microsoft, or like uh, like Firefox at the bottom of the barrel trying to eat up whatever they can. Yeah. Yeah, I try to yeah. tell people that, that Amazon, everything's a lost lead. You know, like yeah. the shopping, they don't care. You know, it all comes down, and they're smart. You can't tell me that wasn't the best play any company made at that point in history was we know how to run these huge logistical networks and, you know, delivery systems and ordering and processing and all this. And we have to have this huge technological stack, technology stack in the background supporting this. Hmm. You know, there's a lot of companies out there that don't have the expertise we have that would probably this, just pay us to do it for them. Hmm. This know? is venture capital in a nutshell. Just lost lead until everybody quits and then you're the only game in town. That's that's it. That's or you just buy out works. all the competition. <laughs> oh, exactly. Exactly. It's. I mean, we've seen it with Apple and Microsoft and everybody else. I mean, it, why innovate when you can just buy it? Yeah. And so they just buy it because it's it, it tends to be cheaper, I suppose, but it gets them on the ground much faster. So yeah. Well, they get, the, they get access to the people who came up with the, the ideas in the first place. And that's really the powerful component. It's maybe not necessarily the product, uh, the, the way that it was carried out, but the idea behind it and then the expertise underlaying that. I mean, that's that's what they're buying. But right. And also the customer base in a lot of cases, right? So if there's a competitor. But yeah, that's the whole unshittification paradigm, right? Where it's like- Yeah, it sure is. You know? It sure is. Um, so it? this is all well-established at this point. It's cow patty what do you on think? cow patty in, on cow patty yeah. on Right, where does it go patty. though, right? Like- and over eventually. for, God, for so. uh, <laughs> an, an arguably important project like Redis, you know, what was their end goal by, I mean, after seeing like MongoDB, what was that? Like yeah. five or six yeah, years ago, same thing. what happened with them and other, other projects. Um, and then the obvious like next day thing that happens when you change your licensing to try to i don't know if they thought it was gonna i'm not sure what they think anymore when they do things like this when they make choices like that well how many um, how, what kind of recourse do they have in that position fighting against a company a monolith megalithic com well, i'm butchering that but the huge, gigantic huge <laughs> exactly what's the word for it anymore uh, yeah, i mean exactly i mean it, it's not even david and goliath it's david and 10 goliaths you know it's just how do you yeah. even fight against that and the only recourse that a lot of these projects have is the license that they use, you know? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, you license something but, MIT and then you, I, I don't know what the license it's, was for Redis. It's, but. it's well established at this point, though, that all Amazon's just going to do is, uh, or wh whoever we're talking about, uh, they're, they're just going to fork it and you're going to have an alternative project that's probably going to get more traction now because it's going to have paid developers yep. well, working on Well, and a built-in yep. user base, and, right? I mean, so, yeah. yeah. But it forces Amazon to do the thing that I was talking about, which was, I mean, invest. You're, I mean, I, I get that you want something for free and you want to just, you know, make your billion-dollar business off the back of people doing work for you for no pay. Yeah, right. But, you know, eventually you're going to have to bring that in-house. And when they do it in-house, I'm less mad at them I just don't like the way that they brought it in house. They should have started from scratch. I made think something that's good. But that's what it comes it com down to, right? Is control. <clears throat> and even if they can assist, fund, support, whatever they can do for these projects, they still can't. That's can. the right thing to do. Well, but they still don't have direct control. And I honestly think that's a risky situation, or they see it as being a risky situation because they don't have, you know, they don't have something down under their thumb that they can directly control and say, you know, to their investors, to whoever, like, this is our technology. Um, this is our... But yeah. for all of its... There's some wisdom in that, too, because, I mean, AWS, there's a lot of really important shit on AWS. Yeah. And they need to be able to tell their customers that we are, if not in charge, we're in control of this entire right, stack. Right, like a customer you looks at, at XZ, yeah. right, at that potential situation, yeah. and they say... Okay, what are you doing to mitigate this? And maybe that's a situation where all of a sudden, you know, it was okay before, but now it's like, yeah, this is a risk. This is a this is a, a way yeah. for us to right. But w when you do that, when you actually do that analysis, that's that's everywhere because it's uh, all the way up and down your tool chain. And you know what's what's Collins 
uh, Colin Lass, what what is his obligation to these the distributions of Linux that were going to be directly affected by all of this? What is what is his actual obligation? I would argue he didn't have one. He oh, I don't. I, I completely agree with you, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. The no, guy could just not, never make another patch, and uh, and I think he still gets no blame for any of it. Absolutely. No, it's it's not his responsibility no, how yeah. people utilize what he's putting out there, yeah. right? I hadn't even considered that because oh, but there's going to be plenty of blame to go his way yeah, from I people suppose. that were upset that you know this almost made oh it hit rawhide so it, it affected some well well I mean dude this entire stack is built off the shoulders of people that didn't even elect to be added into the stack right they just. It was free stuff. It a lot of times the they're scratching their own great. itch. They're fixing their own problems. Right. And because it's open source, they're making the code available. Some other developer, yeah. I mean, I watched our developers do that all the time. They had a very specific problem they were trying to fix or solve. And they would go and look for at least ideas. But then if they would find a project that sort of already kind of fit that space and they just had to spackle around it a little bit, like, yeah, you know, that's a huge adv advantage to them. And so, yeah. Although I wonder, and then you get into all the NPM and uh, Python pip stuff. Uh, what do you call those um, supply chain attacks? Right. I mean, same, same, yeah. thing. same, yeah. same. Um, but that's that's what happens a lot to to modern developers because they're bringing in libraries and packages that uh, that are already written. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, and it's seen mm -hmm. as a as a, a strength and as an advantage because I, sure. Uh, you know, we went from uh, the company you, wait, wait, wait. Open code is an advantage. It is. sure is. It depends on leadership. Mm. It depends on the people who are making the decisions. We had a number of CEOs, CTOs that saw that as a disadvantage and didn't want anything to do with it. And then we had a CEO come in and immediately said, why in the hell are we paying Microsoft and all these other companies, you know, these huge subscription fees whenever we have access to better technology for free? Because... When Microsoft gets a backdoor added without their knowledge, you can sue them. When Colin Lass well, gets a backdoor added, you can't. But that that's a strategy. <laughs> that that's a position you take. And yep. you know, certain yep. obviously there's that adage of you know, nobody gets fired for choosing Microsoft. And I don't know that that's necessarily still true. It always it was when I was doing that, but um, you know It was IBM before Microsoft. Sure. But yes, sure. as well. So for the same reason. Yeah. <laughs> well, Gosh, I feel like we could go on and on all about right, but this let, all day. Let, final but we final better... point. This is why you choose things like GPL, because they're viral in nature. GPL3 more so than GPL2, but they're viral in nature. And then Amazon just won't pick your project. And then you'll never have to worry about it. Yeah, because you're not going to gain anything from Amazon picking your project. That that should be well established. Hey, you now. get exposure, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know that I Whatever. necessarily agree with that. Yeah, a Amazon out here being the influencer saying, listen, if you give it to me for free, we'll say your name a couple times on our next live stream, okay? All right, deal? Deal. Yeah, I mean, if you come up with System D, then maybe you'll get hired by somebody Yeah, but and I think he wanted job, to be hired. What if you made System D and didn't want to be hired and yet everybody integrated it into their systems anyway? That's an extreme high-end case, though, I think, for okay. Okay, Mr. Everybody else. The XZ thing would have hit Red Hat, Debian, oh, Ubuntu. It, it, yeah, we're Windows. talking that this is... <laughs> system D yeah. is in his No, you're systems. absolutely right. So, I... It's... And... It's it's an more people just it's an interesting academic day. conversation. That academic, this I don't happened. Know. It's continuing to happen. It will continue to happen forever. We have all of the data that we need to make better decisions, and yet we won't ever right. because it's hard. hard. It is, and that is the truth. It's hard. Let us know what you think, everybody. I'm sure there's some opinions. <laughs> nah. uh, only mine counts, uh, though. Show at linuxotc.org. Tell us how wrong we are or how right I am. Um, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> we'll be back in two weeks, folks. Until then, I've been Bill. I've been Eric. And I've been Leo. Wait a minute. No, I'm still Leo. No! He did it. He did it. Oh, no, he did it. He did the thing with the thing. <sighs>